Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name's Anna Bryson. I'm a senior lecturer in law at Queen's and the project that I'm going to speak to you about this afternoon is a three-year one. Uh, it's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, it's on apologies, abuses and dealing with the past. So what I'm going to do is I'll take five or ten minutes to basically introduce you to the core tenets of the project, the methodology and some of the key themes that are emerging and I'll then hand over to my colleague here in McAvoy to look in a little bit more detail at some of the case study apologies. So we're about a third of the way into the project or nearly a third of the way into which is to say we're still in the midst of our field research. So really, as I say, I'm going to give you an overview of the project and some tentative um, findings. We're not really at the stage of writing them up in any kind of a definitive way just yet. So to give you an idea of what the project is about, basically um, we are exploring this issue of apologies across three quite different uh, sectors. So looking in turn at the Northern Ireland conflict, institutional child abuse and the economic crisis, and basically taking the island of Ireland as a case study. The key themes that we're teasing out include apologies and the law. So as you might imagine, that comes up very often in interviews as a deterrent why you might not wish to issue an apology, the issue of legal liabilities and so forth. The issue of apologies and accountability, again, came to the fore earlier on when we began to think about what might interest us. I think interestingly as well, Kieran, if you remember one of the first public seminars we had on the project um, where we were kind of getting people to work through the text and um, indeed filmed versions of certain apologies, we were quite struck by the relatively high level of anger against bankers we, you know, when we went through this. And it, when we teased that out, it was about a sense of accountability and the fact that perhaps enough people hadn't been held to account for some of the harms that were perceived in that sector. Um, apologies, acknowledgement and truth, well I suppose this is just trying to unpack it and think about the difference between apologies, how perhaps that difference from, differs from acknowledgement, how it differs from truth. The issue of timing then, choreography and performance. So timing, if you think about it, you mentioned Michael in your introduction, Blair talking about the famine, perhaps the Australian Prime Minister issuing an apology for the stolen generations. How effective is that? How useful is it in terms of when apologies? Is it on the eve of an anniversary? Or indeed, is it because you're backed into a corner and you need to issue the apology? So do you come out and issue the apology or have you been forced to do it? So the motivation would cut across that. Um, Issues then choreography, it's not just the words of course, it's who says it. And in the examples that Kieran will walk you through, that will become very actually I think apparent in terms of some people saying, do you know what, no matter how well crafted the apology was, I won't see past him issuing it. You know, so who issues it, but also what they're wearing, you know, and how it's delivered. Do people perceive the person to sound sincere? So all of that actually very, very important in terms of the effectiveness of an apology and links to performance. Legitimacy then as well, I think in terms of gathering to yourself the right to issue an apology, you are implicitly suggesting that you know you've the right to apologise perhaps on behalf of an organisation. So some quite wide-ranging apologies we've shown to people, they would say, well, who gave him the right to issue that apology? He's speaking on behalf. So this idea of do you actually have the right and the legitimacy to issue an apology uh, on behalf of the people you claim to represent? And again, I think in one of the examples you have, Kieran, there's what we might call solo runs, where someone goes off and issues an apology without perhaps the cover of their organisation. So issues of legi legitimacy are actually quite rich, uh, and that's a theme we're really beginning to explore now in some detail. Audience as well, so who are you addressing when issuing an apology? If it's a private apology, it might be one-to-one -to, -one to a direct victim. But if you think, for example, of some of the papal apologies that have been issued, very often they go through very, very clearly a range of different audiences. So I'm addressing, you know, archbishops, brother bishops. I'm addressing, you know, the clergy. I'm addressing direct victims. And now to the young people of Ireland or whatever. And you'll see sometimes that very closely and carefully calibrated. But often for us, it's a more subtle process of taking apart a statement and thinking, OK, well, that se sentence is to the internal audience. That's addressing you know, your own constituency. That sentence is broadening out that sentence. But that issue of audience uh, is, again, very important. Leadership, I suppose, links back to the issue of who delivers an apology. So who has the, the authority? You know, can 
um, you know, who, who can basically speak? Can Michelle O'Neill issue an apology on behalf of what was done 20, 30 years ago? Does it have to be done by the person who was directly involved in inflicting the harm? That kind of issue about leadership and who issues an apology, and also, I suppose, linking through again to audience as well in terms of, of bringing constituents with you and having the authority and leadership to stretch the ground. Apologies, reconciliation and follow through. You've heard quite a bit this morning about the Stormont House Agreement and I suppose this intersects with our work in this sense. You'll be aware and actually I think that um, visual that Healing Through Remembering produced is, is particularly effective here in setting out those mechanisms that were um, proposed under the Stormont House Agreement quite usefully, I think, putting the IRG at the top. But if you look over to the left-hand side, many of you will be aware that there was a couple of sentences about um, there, there, at the end of this process, at the end, for example, of the work of the Implementation and Reconciliation Group, when all of this work, is, if it ever comes to pass, is kind of pulled together and digested, that there would be statements of acknowledgement on the part of the two governments and that others would be expected to do likewise. So in some ways, I suppose that provides some of the backdrop and context to our work in the sense that it's likely that in the context that I'm speaking about to you today, which is the conflict side of things, but also across the banking sector and the institutional child abuse, there are inquiries and pieces of work ongoing and public expectation that apologies will be forthcoming. So our hope, I suppose, is that this piece of work we're involved in might help in some way to inform that process. Um, and also, I suppose, to say that it feeds into this theme around the idea that apologies uh, could be part of a wider process of reconciliation. Apologies and national imagination then. I guess this points to the fact that when we thought about it and thought about apologies across these three um, sectors, it really became apparent to us that it isn't just about the people who inflicted harms, the people who were directly affected. These issues cut right across issues about how we see ourselves as individuals, as members of communities, what we are offended by, what we're deeply hurt by, our sense of values, what we feel we need to rectify. Much, much broader issues that really link into sort of broader society and encouraged us um, as I come to think about the methodology. And I'll just run down to, to the sort of bottom part of that, because it encouraged us, as I say, not just to engage in the type of interviews that Cheryl referred to that we're quite familiar with engaging in in our methodology, but to go and ask the general public as well what they thought about these issues. And I suppose with the banks it makes sense, because so many people will say we were, we were all, to a certain extent, affected. Some people lost their homes, were very, very deeply affected. But with the bailout, for example, in the South, you know, everybody's paying, paying for, for, for the price for that. Um, and so there was this sense that for many reasons we should go out and engage in what we did, which was a general population survey, um, a door-to-door -door survey of individuals, uh, a stratified sample of the population in Ireland, North and South, um, and following on from that then to engage in focus groups. And actually, I have to say, um, I think it was more instructive than we thought. I think starting out, we did wonder, what are we going to get from this, really, this door-to-door -door survey? But some quite surprising, um, and I think important and instructive issues came to light that caused us to rethink um, some of our key themes and questions. So I think it has been more useful, um, indeed, than we thought uh, starting out. But aside from that, the academic literature review, it's sitting there on the desk, 220 pages. This is a theme that is very, very richly theorised across management, politics, sociology and so forth. Um, and I'm not going to uh, bore you with the details of all of that. But if anybody's interested, happy to talk a little bit further about the sort of academic theory underpinning some of these themes later. Um, but aside from that, semi-structured interviews, 60 to 90, with victims and apologisers across each site, um, and then linked to that as well, focus group work, um, some more in-depth work with victims, four per sector, and then those general population focus groups. So that, in essence, is what the methodology looks like. Um, I mentioned that we wanted to sort of tease apart, perhaps, the difference between the likes of apology and acknowledgement. So this slide really just speaks to some of those differences that you might um, identify in, in terms of an apology being a recognition of a hurt deliberately or negligently inflicted, which is named. So you've got to name it, say what it is. An admission of an individual, by an individual, an organisation or a collective of responsibility. So taking responsibility for that harm or hurt. A statement of remorse or regret related to the wrongful act or omission. A promise of non-recurrence. 
And again, that came through very strongly in the focus groups of people saying, you know, action speaks louder than words. It means nothing if I can't see that it's not going to happen again. Delivered with due respect and dignity, so back to the performance, the way in which it is delivered, and made without reservation, qualification or justification, and that's key. And in some of the examples that Karen will highlight, it's a fantastic apology until you get to, but... We ha and it's that qualifying thing which often, for victims in particular, will say, well, that's where it began to lose traction. Uh, in terms of looking at acknowledgement then, I think the difference between public apologies and acknowledgements is that a public apology is usually an officially or collectively sanctioned statement, but acknowledgement, going back to reconciliation, is usually part of a much broader process that might take in complementary work around memorialization and plaques and so forth. Um, Alongside those interviews and the focus scripts and so forth, I think one of the most important things we have done is that kind of grunt work of sitting in the archives and creating a spine of evidence of apologies that have been issued to date. So some of this work started a long time ago. I think there was a couple of um, interns in Healing Through Remembering, Kieran, if I remember rightly, who had done some good work in beginning to track an apologies that were issued. I think at that stage they were looking mainly at issues... Uh, is apologies issued by uh, Republicans and identified 35. But in recent months, as this project has gathered a bit of pace and momentum, we've had a researcher sitting in the Linen Hall Library and going through successive uh, editions of Unfoblocked and so forth. And we're up to 230, uh, which actually surprised us. So you've jumped from 35 in an initial suite to a staggering 230 uh, apologies, many of them issued, for example, in the name of P. O'Neill for successive generations of same. Now, the first sweep has only begun with state uh, apologies and loyalists and, and indeed some apologies that were issued on the part uh, of unionists. So that, uh, is that th those numbers will increase as that work um, uh, develops. But I think um, I'm going to hand over to Kieran with the next uh, slide because he's then, as I say, going to delve a little bit deeper into these themes in light of some case study apologies. But simply to say that this spine has been useful for us because it points up some very instructive gaps between public perception and reality. And causes us to revisit some of those themes I mentioned about what people hear and indeed you know that idea that perhaps many apologies were issued but for one reason and another people didn't hear them or didn't uh, receive them as they might have been intended to be received. So I think with that Karen, I'll hand over to you to, to take us through some examples. Um, you'll see some resonances and I'm just going to take you through a couple of illustrative case studies. You'll see it's a huge project this and as Anna said we're only a third in. But um, one of the issues that we've been kind of interested in exploring is this idea about voice, but also about listening, about people's capacity or other ways to listen. So you'll see there, that's a, Belfast, that's a quote from the Belfast Telegraph about Martin McGuinness making no apology for the IRA campaign, um, and that should not preclude him from saying sorry. Now, at one level, you might think, so we've tracked all of Martin McGuinness's apologies, and there are lots of them, and, so, and, and very interesting, some of them extremely generous. And that's one example of one that he um, made in, in October 2013, so four years three, four years before that statement from the Telegraph. Any of you who've read his speech that he gave in Warrington, very interesting, and it's in Warrington, like the site of the Warrington bomb, very interesting, very carefully calibrated, very generous apology. But this, this kind of stuff, at one level you could think, well, that's just lazy journalism. Martin McGuinness never said sorry. I think it's something more profound than that. I think, and it's, this has sort of resonated a bit in some of the uh, public focus groups that we've done, is that some people just aren't heard and some people can't hear. And sometimes it's because of direct victimization, and sometimes it's about politics, it's about history. And one of the examples, for example, uh, when we were, Anna and I were doing some of the focus groups in an affluent area of North Dublin, and it was very interesting. So we, and we would, in these focus groups, we'd be going through all the different sectors. So we'd be talking about the conflict related stuff, banking crisis, and the church. And so we got into this conversation about hearing and, and voice and so forth. And I, I think I was using the example of the McGuinness thing, and this one uh, man who self-identified, he said, look, I've I got to be honest with you, I hate the Republican movement, and whatever Martin McGuinness says, I'm not going to hear it. And I thought it was very frank and honest, but it got us thinking quite profoundly about some of these things. About, you know, so as we spend a lot of time and energy trying to help all of the different actors of the conflict, hopefully, um, to craft these things, we need to be cognizant of that reality, of the capacity to hear. Um, the other interesting thing for us in doing the public focus groups um, is is how things sometimes not, aren't necessarily overheard, but certainly have had traction in the public imagination. 
So almost everyone we've interviewed in the focus groups, um, people, even people who say I don't know much about the conflict, or you know, um, even younger generation of people now who would say I don't really know much about it, a lot of them remember the loyalist statement um, and the fact that it concluded the, the words of true and abject remorse. Now maybe it was because you know, at the, the parallel statement from the IRA didn't say anything equivalent to that, so they were the first ones to do that, but it laid down a template. So something happened there, something that those statements, th those exact words, um, have stayed in the public imagination and um, that true and abject remorse. The people will be aware, this is just, uh, as I say, we have 230 of these statements from, from um, Republicans. That's the IRA, sorry, the provisional IRA, the official IRA, the INLA and the IPLO and other very small splinter organisations. So we've tracked some of them. But part of what we're, the, the things that we're exploring, and I'll show you an illustration from a state apology in a moment, is that there are, as Anna said, very diverse audiences being, um, being managed, if you like, or being addressed in the, in the crafting of these things. We've become increasingly aware, particularly in the latter stages of the conflict and during the transition, about how much care and diligence is included in the crafting and, and delivery of these apologies. And so here, and this is the, um, probably the best known IRA statement of apology, um, which is the, uh, 2002, the anniversary um, of, of, of Bloody Friday. Um, and you can see there, so they're addressing, um, they're, they're apologizing for the, for the death of non-combatants, and they're acknowledging fatalities amongst the combatants. So they are, going back to what Charles was saying earlier on, they are making a distinction between um, hierarchies of victims here, um, and that's clear. They're also, you can tell in that, that they are, they are managing their own constituency. And this is a reality for all of the actors to the conflict. So for state apologies, for apologies coming from Republicans or apologies coming from loyalists, all of them think that some of their actions were legitimate. All of them. And so if you're engaged in a process where you think some of the things that we did were legitimate, other things perhaps we can't stand over, but some of the things that we did were legitimate. How do you say sorry in that context? And how do you say sorry without losing your constituency? How do you say sorry? And that's, those are the kind of the, the nuances that we're, 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 we're trying to explore. So this is, again, a very um, a, a generous apology in my view and in the views of some other interviewees, as you'll see in a moment. So this is the, the Queen, her first um, state visit uh, to Ireland, and it's it's beautifully understated, I think, as an, as an apology to all of those who have suffered as a consequence of our troubled past. I extend my sincere thoughts and deep sympathy with the benefits of historical hindsight. We can all see things which we'd wish had been done differently or, or not at all. We had a lovely moment in a focus group in Derry where um, it was with a, 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 a female interviewees from the water site. And so one woman was saying about, she said, oh, I, I, and we asked, do you remember, we were asking people, do you remember this apology? Do you remember that one? And this lady said, I, I, I said, do you remember the Queen's apology? And this lady said, I remember the Queen's apology. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was lovely. You know? I said, well, what was it that you remember about it? She I have to be honest with you. I think the Queen's lovely and brilliant. I think anything the Queen says is lovely and brilliant. <laughs> She's going, okay. So anyway, so I said, okay, that's fine. It's about audience and about hearing, you know. But interestingly, from a very different constituency, um, in our interviews with, uh, with one senior Republican, we asked the same question. What did you think um, of the Queen's apology? And, and, and this is what he or she said. So firstly, that it was hugely significant. It's about who was saying it, what they said, and the context of what they're saying. So it's the head of the British state. For him, it was an acknowledgement of, of British culpability as an actor in the conflict. Third, the context in which the apology is delivered, not just her first state visit, but Dublin Castle, um, and the seat of British rule in Ireland, as people will know. And it was also accompanied by the Queen um, paying tribute to Republican dead in the Gardens of Remembrance. And, and that's, the, that's the quote from him or her. I thought it was a seminal moment of history. Now, this is a, that's, so that's a, a, a generously received apology from senior Republican um, interviewee in terms of... And, now, whether or not the, the Queen had that audience in mind when she, was, she, she and her advisors were crafting that apology, I don't know. But it worked. So it worked not only from the, the, the public focus group on the water side, but it worked for a senior Republican as well. Now, that's the ideal apology if you can reach it that diverse a series of audiences. Um, the, we spent a lot of time in, in, in thinking through the, the, the Bloody Sunday apology, which is probably the most uh, well-known state apology. Um, and uh, you can see here in Cameron's apology, my own personal view on this, it's probably one of uh, Cameron's finest moments as, as, as Prime Minister, um, the delivery of that apology. Um, so you see he too, in the, at the start of this, is also managing a constituency. So he has to contextualise what's about to come by talking about how patriotic he is, about um, how much he values and respects the work of the British Army, as you would expect from a British Prime Minister. So he prefaces those remarks 
by that, the management and addressing of his own constituency. But then he goes on to say it was unjustified and unjustifiable. Um, the members of the ar army acted wrongly, so he's naming a wrong. Um, and the government ultimately responsible for the conduct of armed forces for that on behalf of the government and the whole country, I am deeply sorry. Now obviously people will remember well the choreography that, um, that was involved in that. You had the big screen, this is being broadcast live from Parliament. Um, it's happening outside, outside the Guildhall in Derry. It's a very carefully choreographed, performed ap uh, 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 perfor uh, apology. And, and, and it's received well um, by, by, so by, the, by the vast majority of, of the victims affected. So you can see this is an interview um, with um, one of the Bloody Sunday campaign who's, who, who had lost a family member. Um, and you see there there was a degree of choreography in this in that um, Cameron's office had reached out to a number of people, in my view quite correctly, um, to see what should or shouldn't be said. And if, people, if any, any organisation is going to do an apology, it's just common sense to reach out to your intended audience, be they victims or others, so that you don't get it wrong. Don't use a word that might have a different cult cultural resonance for you or your organisation that will not have traction in the receiving audience. So just reach out, ask people what, what they're expecting to hear, and then you work through what you can or cannot say. Um, but you'll see there, um, this was huge. And, and, and we've, in the number, a number of the interviews we've done and with people who are directly affected by um, Bloody Sunday, we got a similarly generous response to, to, to what um, Cameron pulled off there. Um, here's a, an example of what in our view is a poor apology. So this is a, the apology that, that accompanied the INLA ceasefire statement. So you'll see it at the start of this apology, it seems like it's, it's, it's all going fine. And then it takes a turn, and the, the turn is obviously, again, back to the, ad the, the addressing and managing an internal constituency. It goes on to say, we have ever nothing to apologise for taking the war to the British and their loyalist henchmen. Um, had, I, had I been advising the INLA, I would have suggested leaving the latter part of that statement out. But you can see what's happening there. It is addressing different constituencies. Um, but arguably, that, yeah, that's where you will lose um, a constituency. If, if in the middle of an apology, you restate your organisation or individual belief in the legitimacy of armed struggle. So part of the conversation we've been having with um, uh, loyalists and Republicans who've been talking about is to say um, a statement of apology or acknowledgement is not the place where you reiterate your personal or organisational belief in the legitimacy of armed actions. That's not the place where you do that. That's a different conversation. And the apology statement or statement of acknowledgement isn't where you have that conversation. You have that conversation somewhere else. That's the argument that we've been tic-tacking back and forward with people. Um, and I mentioned the solar run. I'm not going to play this for you, but um, and we're making the assumption solar run. Some of you may um, have seen this on, on the BBC. Um, a former Republican activist called Mick Hayes um, a, on, was interviewed on the BBC and he, he issued an apology um, with regard to Birmingham, which he uh, seemed to suggest he had uh, some inside knowledge of, of what had happened there. Um, we've had no sense from, um, from some of the senior Republicans we've interviewed that this was an inverted commas authorised apology. So we are categorising it as a solo run and we stand to be corrected if someone comes back and says actually that's not the case, that's fine. Um, but certainly in the way it was choreographed, he's dressed in, in military fatigues in the interview, the language used and so forth, it, it, it doesn't have this, a sense of a carefully calibrated thought through um, performance and it played badly um, with uh, the, some of the victims of, of Birmingham uh, as a result of, of, well, probably for lots of reasons, but certainly it didn't come across to us as a particularly carefully thought through or choreographed thing. This is a, a, a quote from another uh, uh, senior Republican ex-prisoner, um, and it's, it's about what, what struck us very powerfully um, in, in this interview, was that he, he goes there, obviously as you would expect from a Republican um, uh, strategist, he re-emphasizes that everything for Republicans is about politics, but then he moves on to the moral dimensions of apology, that actually apologies are, that we have moral as well as political responsibilities <coughs> for our actions. If we can find ways to acknowledge or apologize for actions that hurt people, then we have to try, and we can't do it in expectation of anything. We have to do it because it's the right thing to do, expecting nothing in return. That latter part of that quote is extremely important from our perspective that any, any organisation or any individual who's engaged in this process, you cannot go into the process expecting reciprocity from victims, expecting forgiveness, expecting reconciliation. You do this thing, as this interviewee suggests, because it's the right thing to do, with no expectation of reciprocity. So, clearly, Marx, I mean, we, we, as Anna says, we have 280 pages or 240 pages of a literature review on this, and we're only a third of the way in. 
but the kind of theoretical issues that we're exploring at the moment um, is the relationship between apologies as a kind of final note of violence, a final note of conflict, for, as, or as Republicans or loyalists would see it, a final note of the armed struggle. This is definitively saying it's over. This is a way of definitively drawing a line and saying this is over. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion, as you would expect, expect on the relationship between apologies and truth recovery. And certainly in our interviews with um, victims thus far, we've done and some of our public um, facing work, um, apologies on its own is not enough. Apologies in the way that they're um, envisaged, or, or statements of acknowledgement in the way that they're envisaged in the Stormont House Agreement, they come on the back of lots of other work. They come on the back of, for example, the justice-facing work in the Historical Investigations Unit, um, or the truth recovery work in the ICIR or the IRG. So they're part of that big picture, but in a, just saying sorry on its own, without truth recovery or without the possibility of justice, um, will, not, will not be enough. We have to be honest as well that in, in our, for example, in the 230 odd historical Republican ones that we're doing the analysis on now, and no doubt when we get into the state and the, and the loyalist and unionist ones as well, they're not all good. Apologies are sometimes used for, 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 for wicked reasons, to deny culpability and to obfuscate responsibility. And so in the writing of all of this, we're going to be honest about that and show here, and particularly for, for older historical ones, it's clear that apologies were sometimes used to silence victims, to close down conversations, um, and to obfuscate responsibility and culpability for actions that were wrong. But I think we are, as, as a team, um, persuaded by that, the argument of that senior Republican interviewee that at the end of the day, as well as all of the politics of all of this, and we're, we're immersed in all of the politics of all of this, this is a moral imperative. Okay, thank you.